Welcome, Wake Forest University, class of 2019. My name is Katherine Albanese, and I am the current student representative on the Committee for New Student Orientation and Lower Division Advising. We are so happy to have you on campus as you embark on a journey that I truly hope will be some of the best four years of your life. In the short time that I have with you all today, I want to express the importance of being conscientious and intentional about the diverse collection of communities that you will have the opportunity to both build and become a part of during your time here. As I reflect on these last three years and on how I ended up where I am today, I remember one moment surprisingly distinctly. On my first visit to Wake, my dad and I were handed the typical brochure, the kind one gets at any school, outlining the important statistics and details that help to explain why that university is so great. It is not the numbers in the graphs that I remember though, it is the bolded word community that stretched across the front of the pamphlet that stuck out to me and that I remember to this day. After three years, I can certainly vouch for some of the classic examples of community that have been so valuable to me thus far here at Wake Forest. My Boswick basement hallmates became quick and reliable friends during the initial transition into life away from home, and some remain my best friends today. I later joined a few clubs and started to feel more at home doing the things I have always enjoyed doing while branching out into areas I had always wanted to explore, but I never had the opportunity to do so before. These types of communities are important as they are what settle us and bring us confidence in knowing that we ultimately made the right decision in being here. However, when I think of the communities that have made the biggest impact on my life so far, they didn't start out sounding like my Google definition of a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common or feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, or goals. They began more as a collection of individuals who mutually understood one another without necessarily knowing each other at first, but over time, these self-defined communities have grown into so much more. My favorite example comes from my many travels on the Wake Gray Line shuttle. Quite a few nights of my junior year, I would drag myself out of the library, too tired to walk back to North Campus, and subsequently would pile into the shuttle that always arrived in ZSR Circle and took me right to my door. This process became habitual, and soon, so did my evening conversations with the bus driver named Gary. By the end of the fall semester, he would remember the tests I was studying for and encourage me along the way, and by the end of spring, he was showing me pictures of his newest motorcycle, and we were arguing about Duke and Carolina. These may sound like simple discussions, and maybe he was just chatting to keep himself awake at that awful hour of the night. However, these conversations mattered to me because in the grand scheme of things, he didn't have to care, but he chose to, and that made all the difference in feeling that we were truly a part of one another's community, even though neither of us really predicted that at first. There are other examples of these unexpected communities too. The graduate students in my chemistry research lab who have become irreplaceable mentors, all of the early morning risers, also in dire need of coffee, who eagerly await the perpetual joy of Rosalind, the Starbucks barista, who is always ready to brighten your day, my coworkers turned family at the Wake Forest Bookstore, and the members of the Student Advising Leadership Council, without whom I would have been utterly lost this past year. The larger community ideal is what ultimately brought me to this campus but it has been the construct of these smaller communities in which I have nestled myself that have defined my Wake Forest experience. My biggest encouragement to you all is this, find and build your own communities here and be open to the ones you least expect. There are so many fellow students, faculty and staff on this campus who care about you and are eagerly awaiting to get to know you and support you in every way possible. And remember, you may end up being the person that defines someone else's Wake Forest experience, and that sounds like a pretty exciting prospect to me. I sincerely wish you all the best of luck during your time here at Wake Forest University. We are so excited for you to be here. Get ready for this next adventure. It's going to be a great one. The invocation will now be delivered by Reverend Allman.
Let us pray. Holy wisdom in whose many names we gather, today we officially begin a new academic year. We are bold now to ask your blessing on our beloved Wake Forest and for colleges and universities around the world. This is a day long anticipated by those of us who are beginning their college years. Bless their beginnings. This is a day of honest ambiguity for those of us who have seen many beginnings and endings. Bless our history. This is a day when we meet you in new friends. We see you in the classroom. We hear you in the lecture hall. We feel you in a Hearn Plaza breeze. We visit you in new friends. You are everywhere we go. Deep within our prayer and meditation, we acknowledge your presence. Deeper into silence, you penetrate our hearts and we slowly become the gifts you give us. For we are within you and you are within us. We feel your blessings everywhere in this, our new home. Bless our gratitude. Waken us and assist us to become fully realized human beings. And may we reach out our hands to others becoming, that together we may become enlightened, illumined, and inspired. We are all human beings becoming. Help us to become. Holy and gracious God, you are forever with us, showering us from above with endless opportunity. You are behind us, gently whispering us forward, and you are ahead of us, beckoning us forever forward, never alone, infinitely capable. May we remember this year what during this week of orientation we cannot forget Life is brief, so let our compassion be generous in our perspective broad. Holy wisdom be planted deep within the class of 2019 and scattered wide among us, so when the winter winds have come and gone and the spring mud runs dry and the daylight stretches again to its full length, we may be found at the far end of this year flowering with humanity humility, friendship, and peace. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the living of these days. Amen. It is my privilege to introduce Wake Forest University's 13th president, Dr. Nathan O. Hatch. Dr. Hatch is a nationally respected scholar, and before coming to Wake Forest in 2005, he served as provost of the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Hatch received his undergraduate degree from Wheaton College and his master's and doctoral degrees from Washington University in St. Louis. He was awarded postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard and Johns Hopkins Universities before joining the history department at Notre Dame. Please join me in welcoming President Hatch. Good afternoon and welcome. We are indeed delighted to have you at Wake Forest as the class of 2019. This afternoon, I want to give you three simple stories from my own college experience. In my first semester of college, I had a professor who picked on me. When I raised my hand to respond to questions, he seemed to respond by showing how limited were my answers. Or he added a second question that was a curveball that I had no way of hitting. He singled me out for tough assignments. Early in the semester, he wanted me to write a paper on a lengthy treatise by Niccolo Machiavelli, a name unfamiliar to me. He challenged me to make sense out of that book before I went to a textbook or an encyclopedia. And of course, that was before the days of Google and Wikipedia. When I did well on an early test, Professor Hutchison wrote in response, Nathan, I will send up more flack next time. George Hutchinson picked on me, and you know something? I loved it. He had a keen sense of how learning takes place, 
and understanding that a student's mind is not a bucket to fill, but a fire to light. I found that history course engaging, invigorating, tough to be sure, but it evoked my curiosity and generated a passion to learn that contributed in no small measure to my love of history. At Wake Forest, our goal is to pick on you in this way. This campus is honeycombed with tremendous learning opportunities. It's a banquet to which we invite you to bring healthy appetites. Don't sit on the sidelines. We are blessed with hundreds of faculty members who have given them themselves to study this marvelous world, from the complexities of molecular biology to the dynamics of modern political campaigns, from the insights of Aristotle to the forces at work in Wall Street markets. Faculty love to have conversation partners, and so make sure you engage them at every opportunity. Let me also share a second story. The single most valuable class I had in college was with a professor whose classroom lectures did not buzz with electricity. In fact, they could be downright boring. But for Professor Tom Kay also understood learning. In a 15-week term, this teacher of medieval history assigned 12 papers from a broad range of suggested topics. I remember spending two solid days per week doing the research, the careful thought and reasoning, and the writing of those papers. By the end of the term, I had a sense that something had changed about the way I thought, the way I could argue a point, the way I could express myself. It was as if my mind had gone to the weight room for regular conditioning. I walked out of that class a far more capable and confident person. I mention this to encourage you to learn how to focus and to concentrate. Learning requires silence and solitude, something increasingly rare in our world of iPhones, Facebook, texting, and Twitter. Gail Collins, a New York Times writer, has made the interesting point about leadership development. She says, I think it's hard to be great without the, abil without the ability to concentrate. The more distractions we've built into our culture, the harder it is to have serious thinkers and planners. And in recent years, our span of attention has collapsed to that of a hyperactive gnat. Don't get me wrong, I think it's wonderful that we have digital devices with all that they offer. But the point is that you do have to learn to focus and concentrate. Francis Bacon once said, some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and a few to be chewed and digested. My advice is that on, that on occasion, you cut your media umbilical that we all so cherish, and you practice the art of chewing and digesting an article or a book. Learn the art of deliberate thinking. My final story has to do with the class I took in classical Greek. This was an introductory course that had great potential to be dry as dust, memorizing a new alphabet, conjugating verbs, struggling with vocabulary. But the class was anything but boring because the teacher, Professor Hawthorne, had an infectious love for his subject and for his students and awakened us to many important questions. Today I remember almost none of the Greek taught in that class, but I remember many important lessons taught by a very special human being. There were two in particular, one to ask big questions and the other to engage in active conversation about them. As to big questions, I trust your coursework at Wake Forest will not be narrow. At this place, we invite you to search out life's bedrock questions. What can I know? What ought I to do? And what can I, be and what can I believe? A generation ago, polls tell us that a vast majority of college students, this 85%, entered college expecting the college experience to develop a philosophy of life. Today, less than half of college students have that goal. So today, I encourage you to explore your deepest passions and commitments. Don't just jump through the hoops placed in front of you. Let me also offer a second gift of that class, the art of conversation. 
At Wake Forest, conversation is, is, is at the heart of what we do because it combines ideas and personal interaction, the intellectual and the personal. That is why we are so deeply committed to a residential community, as Catherine suggested. That is why we have faculty fellows in first-year residence halls. That is why we sponsor active dialogue on a lot of important issues. It's been said that a great conversation across the table could be months study in books. At Wake Forest, we are striving to build a community that allows people of different backgrounds, different convictions to live and to learn together. A place that encourages people to give voice to their own beliefs, whether progressive or conservative, radical or traditional, religious or secular. That is a bomb desperately needed in a nation and world that is increasingly polarized. So my advice today is simple. Part of conversation with friends with whom you agree and particularly with those whose world may be very different from your own. On behalf of all of us at Wake Forest, let me say again how delighted we are to have you as a student here. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Here to welcome you on behalf of student government is Adam Hammer. Adam is president of student government, a senior majoring in politics and international affairs and minoring in Middle East and South Asia studies as well as global trade and commerce studies. Class of 2019, welcome to Wake Forest University. Welcome to college, and welcome to a new chapter of your life. Simply being here is an achievement, and choosing Wake Forest to call home is a sound decision. Wake Forest University will offer you more than an education, it will offer you an opportunity. An opportunity to learn from the most brilliant minds in academia and classrooms filled with the most achieving peers. At Wake Forest, opportunity is ubiquitous. I have found that our institution is a platform to go confidently in the direction of your dreams and live the life you have always imagined. Growing up, I moved every few years. Prior to college, I attended seven different schools and consequently experienced seven different orientations. That uneasy feeling of arriving somewhere new, that tingling excitement that many of you might be feeling and that I too have felt time and time again is good. It's a byproduct of embarking on a new experience, an experience that will undoubtedly mold you, train you, and push you. In the face of that reality, you should be excited. Every jump at Wake Forest, whether you, are, whether you take it or are pushed, is an opportunity to grow. And the person you mean to be is truly four years away. I say that because I, I quickly learned when I came here that the members of this community are visionaries. And what starts within these brick walls can truly change the world. Our spirit is contagious. I myself have undergone remarkable change at Wake Forest. From the first time that I filed into Wade Chapel and took my seat within these staggered pews to now standing before you at this podium, I have grown in unquantifiable ways. The things that define me, my principles and values have remained, and my understanding have my, my principles and values have remained, but my intellectual curiosity has deepened, my vision broadened, and my understanding of humanity matured. I have grown, and I'm certain that each of you will as well. Wake Forest has always valued tenacity, and students leave these grounds having adopted a fearless pioneering spirit to dream beyond boundaries. Alumnus Carl Townsend, class of 1924, remarked that his favorite word in the English lexicon is the verb to be. He states that the greatest contribution, of, greatest contribution Wake Forest has to offer is she has a way of instilling into a large percent of the student body an intense desire to be somebody. This quotation from nearly a century ago embodies the spirit that, that defines our mother so dear. Still today, a hunger to be somebody and lead peers is not an esoteric feature that only some students embody it exists in all demon deacons, and always has. 
and you, the class of 2019, embody it as well. Not some of you, all of you. So I challenge you, as you go through the first few weeks of school, think about the person that you want to be when you leave these walls in four years. Push yourself, and don't be afraid to challenge your preconceived boundaries. Jump in, lead, question, and serve humanity. Wake Forest is brimming with opportunity, and if I've learned anything in my three years here, it's dream big, stay hungry for your ambitions, and go get it, period. Take it from me, at Wake Forest it can happen. Finally, welcome home. You belong here. Welcome to the student body. Welcome to a new and exciting chapter of your life. With enough hard work, grit, and determination, I assure you, at this university, your potential to achieve is limitless. And the world outside of these walls will be nothing more than a canvas for your aspirations. Thank you.
is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Gillespie, Dean of the College and Presidential Endowed Professor of Southern History. Dr. Gillespie attended Rice University where she majored in history and English and she received her PhD from Princeton University. She joined the Wake Forest faculty in 1999. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Gospel Choir. That was thrilling and beautiful, wasn't it? President Hatch, colleagues, and especially the men and women of the class of 2019, what an opportunity for celebration today's convocation invites. We come together as a community to welcome you, our newest students, as you begin to explore our hallowed campus grounds. And we seek to indoctrinate you not only into our demon deacon traditions, but into the other powerful riches of university life, especially the life of the mind. And though your life after Wake Forest may very well take you far afield from us, we hope those Wake Forest rituals of thought and action will always be part of your identity, part of your cultural DNA. It is our fervent hope and indeed our plan that the very best of Wake Forest will make its mark on you, on the way you think, on how you understand the world, and on what you choose to do with your life. But before I unveil what may very well sound to you like our diabolical plot to perform a collective mind meld on the class of 2019, I want to invite you to look backwards for a moment, to think with me about all the things you will never have to do again now that you are here. You will never spend another morning in your high school cafeteria taking a standardized test. You will never again have to worry about your high school class rank or high school GPA. You will never have to recite your list of top schools for your family and friends like a parlor game or provide your rationale behind them. You will never again have to empty out all those college recruitment messages from your inbox. In fact, you will never have to apply to any college again. And you will never again have to worry about whether or not you will like your assigned freshman roommate because three days ago you finally met your roomie after a long summertime of wondering. Think about it. All those omnipresent, all-consuming concerns of the last four years of your life are things of the past because you are finally here at Wake Forest. You have made it. I would like to think that you have had some opportunity to relish this transition since your arrival, having shed all those onerous college burdens the moment you step foot on this campus. But I fear that is not necessarily the case. You have been immersed in this whirlwind that is orientation, with little more than mere moments to recognize your newfound freedom or to rejoice in it. You have moved into your dorm rooms and met your RAs, attended what must seem like dozens of receptions and info sessions, picked up your laptops, sent your tearful parents on their way, received pre-professional career counseling, met your academic advisors, learned how to be a demon deacon, studied the honor code, heard about service opportunities and study abroad, and maybe on Saturday night you were even hypnotized, all the while hoping to make new friends left and right and all of this frenzy before you've actually gone to your first class tomorrow. So I say to you, please stop a minute and take a deep breath. Recognize that you have actually accomplished what you have spent so much of your last four, few years working toward. That's stupendous. We are proud of you for those accomplishments. That's why we wanted you here. But we also don't want you to rest on your laurels. Frankly, your laurels will not mean much of anything here, and that is one of the true beauties of a college education. The college experience is a particularly American tradition. It has represented a unique place and time in the transition from childhood to adulthood, originally and for a very long time, just for privileged young white men. It is a collective period when college students are able to try on multiple identities and ultimately mold and shape one's own identity before going out in the so-called real world to make his or her way. The creation of a newly adult self 
has happened in a particular kind of environment, what we generally refer to as the college campus, and that historian John Thelman has gone so far to describe as an American city-state run by and for students. That city-state metaphor may be a little far-fetched, but I do think Wake Forest sets you on your own identity-making journey, giving you four years of relative freedom to figure out what you want to do and who you want to be. With that freedom, as we all know, comes responsibility. And with responsibility comes work. And Wake Forest, as any upper-class student here is quick to tell you, is often referred to as work forest, and for good reason. Indeed, as dean of the college, I do in fact want you to work, and to work hard. Remember, I did tell you just a few minutes ago that I didn't want you to rest on your high school laurels, at least not for very long. You will find in just a day that Wake Forest has laid out an incredible table of learning before you. And to help you navigate that plentiful table are dedicated, imaginative, super smart, and truly engaged faculty members in one department and one program after another. Partake of this liberal arts bounty liberally this semester and over the next seven that follow. Make academics the heart of your college experience. Our faculty will guide and mentor you through that learning process. They take seriously the notion that we are all working toward building an exemplary community so seriously absent in our world. And we do this through introducing you to our disciplinary lenses, to the ways these lenses contribute to understanding the world, and through the ways we engage in you in applying that knowledge. Our faculty are as passionate about you and your learning as they are about creating new knowledge through their writing, their research, and their scholarship. And they will invite you into that journey of knowledge production whether it be in their labs, the archives, or in communities beyond our campus. This learning will be fundamentally different from high school learning, and you should reach out to your professors early on to help you make that transition. My best advice to you is to be open to these new ways of thinking, to get to know your professors, and most of all, and right off the bat, do the work. You have already begun encountering the co-curricular world of Wake Forest through your RAs and the upper-class students you've begun to meet, and you will soon encounter a mind-boggling array of activities, clubs, and organizations eager for your time and talent. They represent another amazing banquet of opportunities for learning and self-knowledge. Eat and drink of that banquet fully. Do not stop at that first organization or activity you happen upon but press yourself throughout your career here to try new things, to move beyond your initial comfort zone, your first social clique, click, to force yourself to taste new flavors. In other words, always do the work of making new friends, finding new interests, and gaining new experiences, whether you are a first-year student or a senior. And I know you have heard these two words already, pro-humanitate, but it is not just the Wake Forest motto. It is ideally a way of life, a moral compass, if you will. And it is for all of us, for students, but also for faculty and staff and administrators and the alumni you will be and we already have who reside in this big Wake Forest community. Pro Humanitate, as our beloved and recently retired classics professor Jim Powell has always reminded us, means first and foremost the quality that makes us human, that which defines us as human, it means the ability to show kindness. It is what defines us as human beings, and it is also the pursuit of human cultivation and learning, which is at the core, as the ancient Greeks saw it, of our humanness. We interpret pro humanitate to mean what we do for the sake of humanity, for the people of the world, as a clarion call to community service. Living the life of pro humanitate, being kind, cultivating learning, and being of service is hard work, and yet it is the richest, most rewarding work imaginable. So I say to you once more, do the work of living pro humanitate. In fact, I want you to do the work of educating yourself, do the work of community building, do the work of pro humanitate, so you can find the particular kind of life's work that you truly love, that makes you passionate, that encourages you to give your gifts to the world. I am not going to say that doing this work and finding your path over the next four years is going to be easy. It can be difficult being a college student. The pressures can be great, pressures imposed on you by your social life and by pressures in the classroom, 
and mostly pressures you impose upon yourself. You can respond to those pressures by narrowing your scope, by focusing solely on your studies, or by making your circle of friends even smaller and tighter. But those reactions are ill-advised. And while it is equally ill-advised to engage in every single opportunity that comes down the pike in a madcap effort to throw all your energies into the wind, employing dynamism and activity, doing the work, is a much better cure for mastering pressures and demands than prevarication and burrowing inward, as well, I think, as a much surer path to wisdom, as long as you make sure you take the time to reflect and consider all along the way. Never forget, though, when you find yourself wondering how you will come through, that we selected you out of some 13,000 applicants this past year because we so deeply believe in your capacity for work, for good work, meaningful work, in all these critical dimensions. Let me close by offering two final pieces of advice in addition to this doing the work. Because after all, this is the purpose of my speaking to you, right? This giving of good advice. I want you to make sure that you leave Wake Forest having done two things over the course of your education here. First, use your engagement with the multiple worlds of learning you will encounter here to yourself. To break free from the limitations of your own head. Use your education to come to recognize what was familiar and comfortable you, to you and why. Use that education to break down those barriers and boundaries created by the familiar and the comfortable, to open yourself up to new ideas and experiences so that you can seize a fuller knowledge of the world. Make that seizing of knowledge be a habit of mind that you could cultivate not only the course over the course of your career at Wake Forest, but for a life. Thank you. Presenting this year's award for excellence in advising is Senior Associate Dean for Academic Advising and Professor of Psychology, Christy Buchanan. Dr. Buchanan received her BA from Seattle Pacific University and her doctorate from the University of Michigan. She has been on faculty at Wake Forest University since 1992. Please join me in welcoming Dean Buchanan. Good afternoon. The Award for Excellence in Advising was established in 1988 to recognize outstanding faculty and staff who have demonstrated commitment to and excellent excellence in advising of undergraduate students, especially at the lower division level. Supported by the Office of the Dean of the College, the award is both honorary and monetary and it complements the awards given for outstanding teaching and research. Nominations are solicited from all faculty, including department chairs, from staff, and from students. You will find a list of previous recipients in your program. The award selection committee consists of members of the Orientation and Lower Division Advising Committee, as well as past winners of the Advising Award. This year, the selection committee chose to honor two individuals who have shown tremendous dedication to and excellence in advising our undergraduate students. Today's first winner started advising new students in 2008. She has eagerly taken on a new group of incoming students every year since, including this year. When I began my work in the Office of Academic Advising three years ago, it quickly became apparent that this advisor could be counted on to be attentive to all advisees but to go above and beyond the call of duty in following up with special concerns or needs. One of this advisor's office colleagues, who sees her work up close, describes her as follows. She goes out of her way to offer guidance and support to her advisees, not only academic, but also emotional and social, while at the same time helping empower them to make good decisions on their own and to learn how best to advocate for themselves. She guides students to make good choices in class selection and is well versed in divisional requirements and other academic policies and procedures that impact students. She considers it a privilege to be an undergraduate advisor and takes seriously the responsibilities that accompany that title. 
despite a very full and demanding schedule in a position that does not normally include and does not require advising, our winner always makes time to offer advice and support to her advisees. Her advisees agree. One says, I have absolutely loved having this person as my advisor. She listens, she is resourceful, and can always solve problems or refer you to someone who can. And she always makes herself available. She also knows everything about Wake Forest. <laughs> she has made my two years here an incredible experience and I can't thank her enough. Another says, my advisor is incredible and definitely a great first face as you enter Wake Forest. She's extremely passionate about seeing students succeed. She makes a conscious effort to put her students first and tailors to each and everyone's needs. With that being said, upon moving on with my major advisor, she continued to remain interested in my success and to keep track of my progress. I am grateful to have had her as an advisor. Beyond her own group of advisees, this person has a hand in advising and supporting all students because she works tirelessly and in partnership with our office, the Office of Academic Advising, to ensure that our new students obtain the critical information they need to get off to a great start. She does this through her work organizing and hosting numerous student receptions every summer, talking to the many students and families who contact her with questions, and through her blogs and newsletters to parents. She is always thinking about ways we can improve our communication with new students. For example, this summer she instigated and partnered with us to create a virtual new student reception for students and families unable to attend a local reception. Perhaps one reason our winner is so knowledgeable about all things Wake Forest and so committed to her advisees and all new students is that she once sat where you sit. She is a double deke, having received her BA here in 1992 and her master's here in 1994. On behalf of the Committee on Orientation and Lower Division Advising, it is my honor to recognize Betsy Chapman, Director of Parent Programs and Communications, as co-recipient of the 2015 Award for Excellence in Advising. Today's second award recipient is, coincidentally, also a graduate of Wake Forest, having received his bachelor's degree here in 1976. Yes, it's truly a coincidence that both of today's winners attended Wake Forest. It wasn't planned. It wasn't a requirement. <laughs> um, I didn't realize both winners were alums until I went to write these remarks. After an early career outside academia, our second winner joined the Wake Forest faculty in 2002. He started lower division advising in 2005 and has advised a new group of first year students every year since, including this year. Since he began serving as a lower division advisor, he has received numerous nominations for the advising award in the annual survey we send to sophomores about their advising experience. I'm going to share representative comments from three of the advisees who have nominated him for this award. One advisee stated, he was able to guide me in taking the best courses for my interests and graduation requirements. He was very knowledgeable about Wake Forest and very easy to talk to. He embodied all of the attributes that made Wake Forest so appealing to me in the first place. Another advisee expressed, he embodies what all advisors should be. He is kind, caring, and selfless with his time. He invests in his advisees and gets to know them as persons while also being an extremely useful source of knowledge. And finally, he is one of the kindest, most considerate people I have met at Wake Forest. He encouraged me through tough times academically and socially my first semester at Wake Forest and was one of the main reasons I chose to stay here. He truly cares for his students and wants them to succeed. He was available outside of formal advising sessions to advise me through any questions I had. He is truly remarkable. 
In addition to his dedication and excellence in lower division advising, this person has shown exemplary commitment to advising and mentoring students within his department, spending countless hours each year on initiatives that connect majors with alumni in his discipline. Most recently, this person's passion for advising and mentoring our students is evident through his decision to join the ranks of our faculty fellows, faculty who commit to spending time in the first year residence halls, getting to know and supporting our newest students. Please join me now in congratulating Dr. Al Reeves, Associate Teaching Professor of Chemistry, as co-recipient of the 2015 Award for Excellence in Advising. That's one of the funnest things I get to do. <laughs> As Associate Dean for Academic Advising, I want to add my personal welcome to those of our other speakers today. For those students who haven't already figured this out, I am the face behind all of those emails you received from the Office of Academic Advising over the summer reminding you of deadlines and giving you information about such things as registration, advisor assignments, and project wake. My first emails sent to you in the first week of May referenced your arrival on August 21st, which at the time seemed rather far off. Suddenly, August 21st has come and gone, orientation is almost over, and you are ready to begin classes. Between May and now, you've already accomplished a great deal. You've completed foreign language placement tests, directed self-placement assessments, course preference surveys, housing and dining forms, health information forms, technology agreements, registration, project wake, and more. That list of deadlines you first saw in Forestry 101 or on our new student website is behind you. Congratulations. As Associate Dean for Academic Advising, it is appropriate that I give you some advice for academic success. But because you've already heard a lot today, I'm going to save my advice for tomorrow morning. Check the Office of Academic Advising's website, that's advising.wfu.edu, or our OAA Facebook page tomorrow morning, and you'll find some tips from me for academic success in college. I hope you will take just a few minutes to read those tips and then bookmark them in a place that you'll review them periodically over this semester. I do want to say that I sincerely believe that each one of you has the ability to succeed here. There is no one road to success and no one kind of outcome that means success. Your journey will be your own. And as Dean Gillespie has already alluded to, it will include peaks and valleys easier times and more difficult times. Here's what I want you to remember. When the difficult times come, when you experience disappointment, challenges, even something you might consider failure, this is not a sign that you don't belong here. And it does not mean that you can't succeed here. Everyone experiences setbacks, disappointments, hardships, and challenges. It might not be obvious that everyone does because we don't usually wear these hardships on our sleeves for everyone to see. But please trust me, it's true. In his book titled, What the Best College Students Do, which is a book I recommend to you, author Ken Bain makes it clear that one important characteristic that distinguishes the best college students from others is not whether they experience setbacks or disappointments, even failure, but whether they use those inevitable experiences as opportunities to learn and to grow. I hope for each of you many moments of rich learning and of reaping clear rewards for your hard work and effort. But also, I hope for you the ability to learn and grow from the harder times. 
To learn and grow from the harder times, you need to remember that you are surrounded by people willing to help you on this journey, who can remind you, if you ever doubt it, that you are a valued member of our community, that you belong here, and that you are able to succeed here. So please reach out for help and reassurance when you need it. And before I close, I have three announcements. The first is that if by chance you did not receive a Wake Forest pin in the making of a Demon Deacon ceremony yesterday, you can get one in the Office of Academic Advising in Ronaldo 125, okay? A second announcement is that although I know you are looking forward to getting started in classes tomorrow morning, don't forget about the remaining ori orientation events this afternoon and evening, including departmental open houses, Pros versus Joes, which is an orientation favorite, not to be missed, and Wakefest, which will highlight tons of student talent. And then a final announcement, hang on to your orientation schedule. But because you can't learn everything about college in four days before you've even been a college student, your orientation continues this fall with some mandatory and some optional events. These include a required college to career event next Sunday afternoon, 3.30 in the afternoon here in White Chapel, an event wel welcoming and honoring you as our newest students at the first football game on September 3rd called Wake the Demons, and three required sessions in which we will continue the conversations we've begun this weekend on living in community, on academic success, and on well-being. We look forward to the conversations we will have with you on these topics once you have a few weeks of college experience under your belts. At this time, I invite everyone to stand for the singing of the alma mater. You've had some practice with this over the weekend, so it should be a bit familiar. The words are found on the second page of your convocation programs. Following the singing of the alma mater, please be seated for the recessional. <laughs> 